physical act of making money in the United States is big business. Many of the techniques used by the modern day money makers were actually developed centuries ago when making money was a confusing and often frustrating experience. The U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing, which prints paper money, and the U.S. Mint, which makes coins, are some of the busiest manufacturing plants in the world. The Mint's two production facilities and the Bureau's two printing plants operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, turning out coin and currency. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing produces uh, approximately 40 million notes a day. These notes have a face value of between 600 and 700 million dollars, depending on denominations that we're running. At the U.S. Mint, officials oversee the production of multiple fortunes. We produce up to 20 billion coins a year, and we sell another 400 million dollars worth of gold, silver, and platinum bullion coins and collector coins that we sell all over the world. Plus, we protect about $100 billion worth of assets of the federal government at Fort Knox and at our other facilities around the country. Working in conjunction with the Department of the Treasury, the Bureau and Mint continually feed the economy's voracious appetite for new money. Though coins have been around since before Christ, it was the Roman Empire that first struck coins as a standardized method of currency. The precious pieces were emblazoned with images of leaders, like Julius Caesar. The term to strike a coin is still used today. It comes from the early method used to make a coin. Artisans would hand carve metal dies, place the molds over pieces of heated metal, and strike down with a hammer to embed the image onto the new coin. But it was during the tense days of the American Revolution that the world's most powerful form of money, the American dollar, was forged. There were dozens of forms of money used in the colonies at the time. Some were from other countries, some from banks, some from the colonial governments. The situation that, that Jefferson viewed and when he advocated this uh, coinage system it was a nation in which the United States was a nation in which we depended upon other nations coinage we used other nations coinage and there was probably four or five different countries coinage that circulated as legal tender in the United States and it was a mess because every colony had its own exchange rate and it had multiple forms of coinage that were circulating Thomas Jefferson believed the only way the new nation could survive was to have a unified monetary system. With his backing, Congress enacted the Mint Act of 1792. The legislation established the nation's first mint in Philadelphia, then the nation's largest city and its capital. In an effort to get the mint into production, Martha Washington donated her family's silverware for the nation's first silver coins. And though the government had high expectations for its new mint, the building itself had more humble beginnings. They chose an old distillery, an abandoned distillery, and unfortunately that building has been lost to history. Ye old mint, as it was called, was a pretty modest facility. It was hand-turn presses, which a number of men would uh, hand-turn by pressing their bodies against it. As you can imagine, uh, through a process like that, the production of coinage was slow and the standards were inconsistent. In order for new coins to succeed, all other coins would have to be made worthless. It wasn't a popular idea. Jefferson really came to un understand how over the long term the country just could not conduct its, its business and it could not conduct its economy with this kind of a system. But it was a tough political sell to convince Congress that they should bite the bullet and spend these huge sums of money 
to create a mint and create a coinage system. And the really tough part was to demonetize all the, that coinage of other nations that was circulating here in the United States. That was a very tough sell. Slowly, new U.S. coins began circulating. Gold dollar coins, a half dollar coin, silver dollars, and a half dime, which eventually became the nickel. There were also two copper coins made, the penny and the half penny. Designs on the coins were chosen to represent the symbols of the new nation, Lady Liberty and the American Eagle. American coins at the time had a value equal to the amount of metal that was in them. But since the coins were scarce, the colonies, banks, businesses, and even private individuals took it upon themselves to print early forms of paper money. Because the paper money was backed solely by a promise by the issuer to pay, the value of a paper note was always changing. These bills were early forms of promissory notes. They would go based on the faith of the people in that government that was issuing the currency or the person that was issuing the currency. Sometimes individual people would issue the currency and people would accept the currency because they knew that this person was a, a man of means and would take it back and they could circulate it around so they wouldn't have to carry around a bag of gold with them. There was no formal method of exchange. What a person could get for their money was up to them. We got into sort of a tower of Babel in paper currency. We had a similar situation to what Jefferson had sought to alleviate with coinage. Currency traded around the issuing banks at face value or something close to face value. But then the further you got away from those issuing banks, they traded at a discount to face value because of the inconvenience of having to go take them back to that bank. And then once you got a certain distance away, they weren't worth anything. Uh, no one would accept them because they didn't know what the credit worthiness of that bank was. The American monetary system became more confusing when the nation experienced its first gold rush in the 1830s. Gold had been discovered in the mountains of the Carolinas and Georgia. Mining companies needed a way to get their newfound gold dust into circulation. The only alternatives was to take this gold dust and either ship it to the only mint in the country, which was in Philadelphia, and the roads were difficult to get to and took a long time, or to actually use the gold dust. For a while, stores near gold mines would have scales at the register. A miner could pay for his purchases with a pinch of gold dust. The process was messy and inconsistent. A German metallurgist named Templeton Reed, who had come to America in search of gold, had a better idea. If the miners couldn't get their gold to the mint in Philadelphia, then he would build his own mint near the mines. An illegal act. Reed's mint was an immediate success. Within a year, nearly 40 other privately owned mints had opened in the southeast. Gold coins poured into the economy. And though the government wasn't happy with privately minted coins in circulation, it didn't have the resources to stop them from being made. The result of the influx of all these miners and the gold led to a reevaluation of our nation's uh, coinage. It also led to expanded economic trade and development in the area. Stores and shops opened. Merchants did booming business. But the frenzy of the East Coast gold rush subsided within two years. The mines dried up, and the privately owned mints closed down. For the next decade, the making of money would remain the same. But by the middle part of the century, a series of events would forever change how money was made in America. The gold rush of 1849 was just around the next bend. The words mint and money come from the Latin word moneta. Moneta was the name of the temple of the Roman goddess Juno, the place where Romans first struck their coins. U.S. Mints will return on Modern Marvels. 
On January 24, 1848, a carpenter named James Marshall was inspecting the site of a proposed lumber mill on the American River near what is today Sacramento. Marshall stumbled across some gold-colored nuggets. The great gold rush was on. Miners came in droves to Northern California. Gold flowed out of the hills. As a result of the gold rush, some $600 million worth of gold dust over a period of several years actually hit our nation's coffer, creating a huge economic impact, not only on California, both politically, socially, and economically, but in the entire United States. Millionaires were created overnight. Construction was at an all-time high. Banks were flush with money to lend. But as in the East, there was concern over what to do with all the gold. Shipping the gold to the Philadelphia Mint was difficult. It would take six months before gold coins would make it back, if they came back at all. As a result, some miners started making deals with Mormon settlers. A few years before the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, the Mormons had discovered small pockets of gold in the Sierra Nevada. The Mormons had set up a small mint in Salt Lake City to strike their gold into coins. But their mint couldn't handle the wagon loads of gold coming from the mountains east of San Francisco. The few $10 gold pieces produced by the Mormons during this period are today considered rare collector's items. Well, this sounds great, but it created a problem. Uh, especially in San Francisco, you would have sailors coming into town and abandoning their ships and going to the gold fields. You had farmers leaving their, their farms and going to, to the gold fields. The prices of necessities skyrocketed as a result. Rents tripled in a year and no coins. Miners tried to buy goods and services with the gold dust they carried with them. But as in the Carolinas, it was an inefficient way of doing business. You can imagine uh, coming in from mining the gold and coming to San Francisco and entering a saloon and in exchange for a shot of whiskey the bartender would dip down with his thumb and forefingers and pinch out a bit of gold dust from the pouch. Well, pretty soon all the owners of the bars, and there were quite a few of them, would hire only big, burly guys. And they would ask them in their interview, now how much can you raise in a pinch? The business community in California pleaded with the federal government to establish a mint out west. The tons of gold coming into San Francisco is causing mass confusion. And while the gold rush boomed in California, other states were lobbying the federal government to open assay offices, or mints, in their jurisdictions. Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina, and New York all wanted their own mint. Having a mint nearby guaranteed a constant flow of coins into the economy. And even though California's gold was more than enough to warrant a mint being built in the Golden State, it didn't happen. So, as in the East a decade earlier, private mints slowly began to fill the void, even though federal law prohibited them. The first coins privately issued in California was in May of 1849 by Norris, Gregg, and Norris uh, out of New York. And they were located in Benicia, which is north of San Francisco. They issued $5 gold pieces before they moved to Stockton. We know they moved to Stockton because one coin has shown up with the word Stockton on it. It's the only one we know of, so if you find another one, it'll be worth a lot of money. The first coin makers in California actually didn't make many coins at all. They instead made gold ingots because they weren't sure what penalties they would incur for striking coins. In 1851, after two years of gold mining in California, the federal government finally decided it needed to do something. The U.S. assayer of gold sent a man named Augustus Humbert to San Francisco. He brought dyes with him 
and planned to contract with a local gold coin company to make U.S. coins. The government chose to work with James Moffat, who owned the private mint of Moffat & Company, because of the firm's solid reputation. Upon hearing that U.S. coins were going to be minted in California, most coin makers began melting down their gold coins in anticipation of selling the raw material to the government. But there was a hitch. The government only issued $50 gold coins. With most of the smaller coins now destroyed, there was no way for citizens to make change. So you had to turn this dust into something that was acceptable. And really the only coins they liked were by Augustus Humbert, and they were $50 gold slugs. Well, try and change a $50 bill today when there's been a little inflation since 1848. So these things got unwieldy. Essentially, you had no one producing coins that were acceptable for commerce, and it's sort of hard to carry around a bag of dust. In 1854, the federal government could no longer ignore what was going on in California. The San Francisco Mint opened, in the building used by Moffat & Company to strike private coins. But gold production in Northern California had begun to slow. A new metal would supplement the economy's need for coins. In 1859, when the Comstock Lode, the world's richest silver strike, was discovered near Virginia City, Nevada. The sleepy village turned into a bustling mining town. Excavations along the eastern slope of Mount Davidson yielded more than $300 million in silver over 20 years. With gold getting scarcer, silver became a major ingredient in the making of coins. Soon stagecoaches loaded with silver galloped from Nevada toward the San Francisco Mint. But success came at a high price. With so much money being transported through California, it was only a matter of time before a different kind of gold rush gripped the state. For every honest miner trying to get his strike to a mint, there were two others who were willing to take it from him, by whatever means necessary. In San Francisco, the mint became a symbol of triumph, when in 1906, it still stood after a killer earthquake devastated the city. There are very famous photos of the old San Francisco men standing proudly among the rubble of the rest of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. And that building really was a symbol of, of the resilience of the city and its determination to, to return from that devastation. Though it had stopped mass-producing coins by the mid-1950s, the San Francisco Mint still struck commemorative coins for collectors. Sadly, the building would have to be shut down after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. The century-old facility could not withstand the shock of a second major quake. In 1863, officials at the U.S. Mint suggested the words, Our Country, Our God, or God Our Trust, be placed on all U.S. coins. The Secretary of the Treasury amended the suggestion to In God We Trust. U.S. Mints will return on Modern Marvels. During the heady time of the mid-1800s, the making of money in the West was dirty business. Murder, deception, and greed became hallmarks of the dark side of the gold rush. Mining companies had to hire special guards to keep a close eye on their employees. The temptation of pure gold and silver in the pocket could lure even the most honorable of men. You had people who were taking these $50 gold pieces, which were two and a half ounces of gold, wrapping them perhaps in a, in a handkerchief or whatever, and slugging a people, people over the head to relieve them of their gold coins or gold dust or whatever and perhaps that's where we got the term $50 gold slug. Stagecoaches carrying gold and silver from the mines to the San Francisco Mint 
were constant targets. In 1864, in Carson City, Nevada, not far from the Comstock Lode, private miners started their own mint. It was safer to make the short trip to the Nevada capital than risk being robbed along the roads to San Francisco. It was eventually taken over by the federal government. It closed in 1893 after striking more than 50 million dollars worth of Carson City silver dollars and other coins. While Carson City thrived on the Comstock Lode silver, a third American gold rush began. In 1860, we had another gold rush, this time in Colorado, Pikes Peak or bust. And many of the people who were involved in the California gold rush went out to Colorado to get involved in mining and minting coins. Once again, there was a need for a new medium of exchange with the influx of people in the area and uh, a major banking house by the name of Clark Gruber and Company uh, who was buying up the gold dust and, at the time and shipping the gold dust out to Philadelphia and having it come back as coins got the idea that hey we can do it right here. The mining company authorized an artist to design a coin signifying the gold discovered at Pikes Peak. Unfortunately, this gentleman uh, never had made it out to Colorado to see what Pikes Peak looks like. So the first dyes that came out were of a mountain, to be sure, but not the one that people were familiar with in the area. So these 1860 $10 and $20 gold pieces that had this mountain on it were soon discredited, and people refused to take them. And as a result, they were forced to come up with new dyes with the familiar Liberty head on one side and the eagle on the other. For the next 30 years, the debate over how to make the nation's money and how to standardize it continued. By the late 1890s, the federal government pushed for a gold standard in which every piece of currency would be backed by gold. Coins uh, were made of uh, precious metal, gold and silver, so that a $20 gold piece was said to contain $20 worth of precious metal. In 1896, presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, a bimetallist, delivered his famous Cross of Gold speech. Bryan wanted U.S. coins to continue to be backed by both gold and silver. Known for being one of the nation's most outspoken orators, Bryan blasted those who wanted a gold standard, saying, You shall not press down upon the born of labor this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Though his speech may have been dramatic, Bryan lost the election, and the Gold Standard Act was passed in 1900. With all forms of money issued or coined by the United States now backed by gold, the government had to control the production of money carefully. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, coin production in the United States remained about the same. Between 200 million and 500 million coins each year. But during the Depression years of 1931 through 1933, the Mint struck a total of just 70 million coins for all three years. Less than a decade later, during World War II, the Mint struck up to 2 billion coins a year. During the last part of the 19th century, the U.S. Mint began to make commemorative coins. Historical events, such as the Battle of Gettysburg, were placed on coins as a way of enshrining some of the most important episodes in American history. Even presidents got into the act. Teddy Roosevelt worked closely with a famous artist to create one of the nation's most enduring coins. Teddy Roosevelt was a collector, and he also took an interest in art and he worked hand in glove, really, with the great American artist engraver, St. Gaudens, in the creation of what I think is one of the most beautiful coins in the world, and certainly one of the most beautiful coins produced by this country, which is the American Eagle a design. It's the standing liberty that graces the gold coin of the United States even today. 
Sometimes, coins such as the Susan B. Anthony were put into circulation without success. The dollar piece had a major flaw. It looked and felt just like a quarter and quickly fell out of favor. It's remarkable how deeply held people's feelings are about coinage. In currency in general, what I've really found is that there's a lot of resistance to making changes. And when you make changes, you really have to explain why you need to make them. However, in 1999, the U.S. Mint implemented the 50-state quarters program, which introduces five new quarters every year for 10 years. Each one bears a reverse design honoring one of the 50 states. The coins are released in the order that the states joined the Union. Besides protecting bullion depositories at Fort Knox, Kentucky, the Mint oversees depositories at West Point, New York, and has coinage facilities in Philadelphia and Denver. The act of striking coins is the same as it was 100 years ago. It's just done much faster. But what has changed is the material with which coins are made. The Coinage Act of 1965 eliminated all silver from the nation's dimes and quarters. In the United States, we shifted from a precious metal or silver-based coinage in the 1960s. And by the late 1960s, all of our coin denominations had moved from a silver base to a, a base metal. In most cases, a cooper nickel or copper nickel combination. If you pick up a quarter that is dated in the mid-1960s or earlier, if you can find one of those, and you can look at it from the side, it's all one color. And that's because it's a 90% silver coin. If you look at the more modern versions of the quarter, they look like a sandwich. You have the red inner layer and the silver outer layers, and that's that copper nickel sandwich that we use today. While coins may have had an eventful history, paper money's story is equally dramatic, beginning with its becoming the government's most powerful weapon in wartime. Whenever the U.S. Mint has debated discontinuing the penny, the idea has been met with public outrage, especially in Illinois, the home state of Abraham Lincoln. U.S. Mints will return on Modern Marvels. At the start of the Civil War, both the North and the South quickly realized they needed one thing very badly, money. U.S. President Abraham Lincoln and Confederate President Jefferson Davis did the only thing they could do to raise more capital. They printed money. Paper currency was initially issued during the Civil War to fund the Civil War. Uh, the need for money far exceeded the coinage available at that time. Uh, the simplest, most uh, expeditious way of getting uh, money into the system at that time was to print paper notes. Though private institutions such as banks and businesses had printed their own paper money for more than 50 years, this was the first time for the federal government. Many experts believe that the first U.S. dollars were printed with green ink out of fear of counterfeiting. The same technology that allowed photographer Matthew Brady to record the images of the Civil War could have been used to make duplicates of currency. Green ink was applied to one side of the nation's new currency because it could not be duplicated with black and white photography. Green ink was more chemically stable than other colors. And engraving officials believed the color green represented stability. Many experts believe that is where the term greenback first originated. And though the first U.S. dollars were slightly larger than those in circulation today, the ink and the paper on which our money is printed is virtually the same. It's made of cotton and linen fibers as opposed to wood pulp fibers. It's not woven, it's not a cloth, it is a paper, uh, but, the, but the material is a little different than your traditional paper. And, and this rag paper was so called in the old days because the cotton and linen fibers were actually obtained from rags. Because the new paper money was backed by nothing more than the government's willingness to pay, its value depended on the fortunes of the armies on the battlefield. 
When the Confederate government was doing well, its notes were high. And of course, as it started losing the war, they depreciated rapidly. The Union notes were the same thing. Beginning in 62, they almost circulated at par, and then they started dropping. In 1864, they got down to 38 cents on the gold dollar. Merchants were vulnerable to swindlers. Cheats would try to pass devalued paper money off at par, its face value, even though they knew it was worthless. A lot of times the merchants would put an ad in the newspapers saying, so-and-so likes to drink his lager beer, but he doesn't like to pay for it. You know, today he offered me at par uh, for this bill, and of course I had to accept it or take nothing. Be warned of this guy. But there was one place in the Union that paper money was not welcome. The far western states, especially California. Californians hated paper currency. The state passed laws to ensure that paper notes would not circulate in its economy. It was easy for California to do. The state was still flush with coins from the gold rush. The assistant treasurer of the United States came and spoke on the glories of greenbacks. And of course the audience was very appreciative. They yelled, hang him, hang him, hang him, chased him out of the building and they took refuge in a drugstore. But, you know, if they'd caught him, you might have had the top federal government financial official dangling from a light post. San Franciscans were especially hateful of paper money. As an affront to the government, people who lived in the Bay Area would gladly accept only one type of paper money. That issued by a local character who believed himself to be of royal descent. And that was put out by His Imperial Majesty Norton I, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico. Poor Joshua Norton had come from South Africa, very successful Gold Rush Commission merchant, tried to corner the rice market, lost when ships came in, and also his bankers weren't very nice to him, and he lost part of his mind. Well, in the 70s, he started printing his own money, usually in 50 cent increments. And of course, people would accept the, the imperial bonds to help out Joshua Norton. In fact, when he died in, in 1880, his funeral was the, the largest procession that San Francisco had ever seen. Eventually, Californians too began to accept government-backed paper money. In the decades after the Civil War, Paper money became not just a means to do business, but an expression of national culture. In 1895, for example, world-renowned artists were commissioned to create elaborate designs on a new series of banknotes. It was called the Educational Series, and the bills featured scenes from the fields of arts and science. One bill showed a semi-nude woman it so enraged the wives of bankers in New England that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing was forced to pull the bill from circulation. The incident is where the phrase, banned in Boston, originated. After decades of trying out new looks, the U.S. Treasury chose a consistent design and size. In the 1920s, the decision was made to standardize the design of currency and to reduce the size to the current six and a quarter inches by two and a quarter inches. And that change in size was actually done as a production uh, enhancement. Obviously, printing a smaller note provides more notes per every turn of the press, uh, so that it was an ec economic move uh, to be able to produce more currency at a lower cost per note. Although Americans soon became used to their uniform dimes and nickels, ones and one hundreds, and the government became used to making money efficiently, that didn't mean it could make endless amounts of it. A few years earlier, Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act in order to stabilize the nation's money and banking system. It provided an elastic currency that could expand and contract in response to the economy's changing demands. 
the U.S. Mint and the Bureau of Printing and Engraving operate as manufacturing plants. Their only customer is the Federal Reserve Bank, which has 12 districts nationwide that monitor the economy's money supply. When the amount of available cash in a district falls short of acceptable levels, the Federal Reserve places an order with the Mint and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to deliver more money. Federal Reserve notes are the only U.S. currency issued today. Though the notes look nearly the same as they did a century ago, recently added security features have made our hard-earned cash smarter and safer against counterfeiters. The U.S. Mint and Bureau of Engraving and Printing have also made money for foreign governments, including Mexico, the Philippines, and Cuba. U.S. Mints will return on Modern Marvels. There are approximately $650 billion worth of U.S. currency in circulation around the world. The Federal Reserve estimates about 60% of that actually circulates outside of the United States. U.S. currency is considered the world's currency. It is used in many countries as their day-to-day -day currency, and others people hold it as a store of value. And because it is the world's currency, it must be highly guarded. The U.S. Secret Service works in conjunction with the Treasury Department to prevent counterfeiting. With advanced digital technology, their job is increasingly difficult. Counterfeiting over the last decade or so has tended to increase due to the availability of reprographic equipment. Color copiers, inkjet printers, computer scanners have put the capability uh, to reproduce a semblance of a currency note in the hands of most of us. Therefore, the Treasury Department continues to design new bills with advanced security features to foil counterfeiters. In 2003, the most used and counterfeited note in the U.S., the $20 bill, became the first in a series of new color money to be released. For any bill, the way to defeat tech-savvy counterfeiters starts with an ancient art. Inside a cramped office in the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C., a handful of skilled artists design the metal dies that will print U.S. currency. There are only seven engravers in the United States who do this work. Each one has a specific job, concentrating on individual aspects of the bill, such as the portrait or the numbers. Doing a specific task gives each engraver a chance to become expert at his or her art. It also prevents one person from having all the skills needed to make bills on their own. The engravers work to create a master die, which is then reproduced onto plates and used for printing at facilities in Washington, D.C. and Fort Worth, Texas. Each piece of a bill, the portrait, the numbers, the dates, and signature are all done by different engravers. Tom Hipshin has been an engraver for the Bureau for 35 years. He engraved the portrait of Andrew Jackson on the new generation $20 bill. The art of engraving itself uh, hasn't changed much. The tools are very similar to what they were 400 years ago. But the, the technical aspects of it have changed a great deal. We spend a lot of time checking the depths and widths of lines for printability, uh, tailored just for the machines that we're going to use to reproduce it. To make the engraver's job even more complicated, all their work is done in reverse. Because it's a direct printing process, I actually have to engrave it in reverse in steel. So I make a very accurate tracing of the image and lay it on the surface of the steel in reverse uh, and draw it very carefully the way I want it to appear using sharp steel points. We still need hand engravers to engrave like the portrait and the vignette on the back. Secret Service relies heavily on our hand engraving in their counterfeit deterrent detection. Counterfeit notes, uh, you can tell a real difference between an engraved portrait and the photocopies. The new 20 also has subtle background colors, green, peach, and blue on both sides. 
Adding color provides the Bureau of Engraving and Printing the opportunity to add additional security features, to make the note more complex, to make it harder for people to be able to accurately copy, to reproduce, make it easier for people to recognize, keep people's interest up, and make our notes safer, smarter, more secure. Not since 1905 has any U.S. currency had a colored background. Then the $20 gold certificate had a golden tint and a red seal. Today's new color money costs about eight cents per note to make. And for the first time, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing used computer technology in its design. It was my responsibility to take the design which was already in place and transfer into the security computer and um, create vector graphics and use the computer modules to create fine line details in the background, which color was added to, and that's how you get the colors in the background of the 20. This unit produces the color on the background of the press. Uh, it will print all the different tones on the back of the note. Uh, on the other side of the press, we'll be doing the same thing, simultaneously printing the face, so that the sheet gets printed one time, both face and back, producing all the colors that you'll see on the currency. After the color is added, the sheets are printed three more times. First, a traditional green 20 is printed on the back of the note. And then the portrait on the front is printed in black intaglio ink. Additionally, the copper to green color shifting ink is printed for extra security. Andrew Jackson has a makeover as well. Andrew Jackson, of course, is still in the new bill. Um, what's been removed is the circle that went around the portrait. Uh, it gives the note more of a presidential look. Despite the new changes, many features will remain the same. U.S. currency has been known uh, since it's been printed here at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in 1860 as greenbacks. The color of the back, the intaglio ink, that engraved image on the back has been and will always be green. Uh, the new ones will still be green on the back. We'll add some color underneath it. But the primary color, it's still green. It's still a greenback. As in its previous design and as in its counterparts, the 100 and the 50, there is a polymer thread embedded vertically in the paper and has printed on it the bill's denomination. The watermark is also on the note, a faint image similar to the portrait, visible from both sides when held up to the light. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing will produce about two billion new $20 notes a year. Following the introduction of the new 20, there will be a new color 50 and 100. The colors on the upcoming 1500 will be different. Uh, part of the thought process was denomination by color. I know when the last change occurred, a lot of people complained that they looked too much alike. People were getting 20s mixed up with 50s by not looking at the portrait. The next gen series, each denomination will have a separate color combination. Right now, we have made no decision on a 5 or a 10. However, those are under study and well could be changed in the future. As the look of our money changes, so does the way we spend it. Today's monetary system is rapidly evolving. Credit cards, ATM machines, and electronic banking have become a way of life. As technology improves, there may come a day when the nation sees the death of money. But for now, those in charge of making money believe there will always be a need for cold hard cash every piece of money the u.s. mint and the bureau of engraving and printing make is not only currency but captures a moment in time and defines each generation no other form of art carries with it the power and history that exists on every piece of legal tender <laughs>